The Biden administration really wants to counter disinformation. After facing backlash for creating a disinformation governance board, government officials are expanding surveillance quietly and getting corporations to do the work for them. Welcome to America Uncovered, I'm Chris Chappell. This episode is sponsored by Incogni. You probably know that companies are collecting your personal data, but you may not realize just how many. Dozens, maybe hundreds, most of which you've never heard of. And you have no idea what they're doing with it. Incogni helps stop them. I'll explain more at the end. So disinformation is not new. People like to blame social media, but fake news has existed for as long as newspapers have been around. And probably longer. How do you think the Greeks got the Trojans to just bring this giant wooden horse into their city? Classic disinformation campaign. Yes, I'm still working on Troy Uncensored. But back to America. To hear President Joe Biden tell it, disinformation is one of the biggest issues today. I guess we shouldn't be surprised. Remember when Biden called on Facebook to tackle misinformation after saying it was killing people? Of course, the U.S. government can't actually try to control what people say. Not even by proxy. I mean, all Biden did was publicly encourage a private company to control what people say, and it still didn't go over well. And for good reason. Because censorship is kind of a big no-no, especially when the government gets involved. That would be a violation of the First Amendment right to free speech. But government officials have some ways to get around that. Because to a lot of politicians, amendments aren't rights so much as they are inconveniences. One way the Biden administration tried to get around the First Amendment was by creating a disinformation governance board under the Department of Homeland Security earlier this year. It was designed to counter disinformation that allegedly threatened U.S. national interests. And if you're wondering who gets to decide what is or isn't true, you're starting to see the problem. This faced a lot of backlash, including being called Biden's Ministry of Truth, the reference to 1984's surveillance state. The board was put on pause and then died a sad death in August. Sorry, did I say it was sad? I meant to say people were relieved to see it dead. Kind of like when you find a giant dead spider in the corner of your room. Imagine the damage that thing could do if it were still around. But it turns out that wasn't the end of it. According to The Intercept, the truth cops are still out there. They looked at leaked documents from the Department of Homeland Security. While free speech advocates cheered the dissolution of the board, other government efforts to root out disinformation have not only continued, but expanded to encompass additional DHS sub-agencies. That same month when the Disinformation Governance Board died, the DHS Office of Inspector General published a report about accelerated moves towards policing disinformation. Apparently, those include making graphic novels, which I know seems cringy, but the FBI already makes movies, so next thing we know, Homeland Security will start a whole cinematic universe to counter disinformation. It'll be exciting at first, but pretty formulaic and stale by about the 19th movie. More and more government agencies are expanding their responsibilities to include tackling disinformation. Agencies like Customs and Border Protection, ICE, and the Secret Service are among them. Now, to be fair, this isn't unique to just the Biden administration. After terrorist organizations like ISIS blew up online during President Barack Obama's presidency, social media giants started working closely with Homeland Security to monitor and remove terrorist-affiliated accounts. Then FBI Director James Comey warned that law enforcement agencies needed to rapidly adapt and confront the challenges posed by terrorist networks that tap into social media, which seems reasonable. And then the government started going down the slippery slope. So how did government agencies adapt to terrorists using social media? By investing in firms and software that monitor social media feeds, which is upsetting because that means the government is looking at your Instagram and didn't even have the decency to like your posts showing off your homemade crab cakes. 
Why did this get zero likes? Must be the algorithm. But efforts to counter online threats really started to double down in 2018. There were several hacks on high-profile firms in 2018. That led to Congress passing and President Trump signing the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency Act. It established a new agency under Homeland Security that would be responsible for protecting cybersecurity and national infrastructure, called the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, or CISA for short. Yep, Homeland Security, but for the internet. Does that mean I need to take my shoes off and go through a metal detector before posting on Reddit? CISA was a response to things like the 2018 Colonial Pipeline cyber attack. But it wasn't long before CISA's mandate to protect critical infrastructure started to change. Encountering disinformation became a big thing. I'll explain how after the break. Welcome back. Back in 2018, the U.S. government established CISA to protect U.S. cybersecurity and infrastructure. Some of its duties included monitoring social media and informing private sector platforms of disinformation concerns from foreign sources, which has to be exhausting. Pointing out disinformation on social media is like pointing out grains of sand on the beach. Homeland Security originally formed a bunch of government entities to counter foreign disinformation. This included units like the Countering Foreign Influence Force in 2018 and the Foreign Influence and Interference Branch in 2019. But something began to change. In 2021, CISA replaced the Countering Foreign Influence Force with the Misinformation, Disinformation, and Malinformation Team, which sounds like the most boring Law and Order spinoff of all time. This was to promote more flexibility, to focus on general misinformation, disinformation, and malinformation. In other words, instead of just countering disinformation produced by foreign governments, they're policing domestic disinformation too. In practice, this often means having officials send examples of potential disinformation to CISA, like these parody Twitter accounts pretending to be the Colorado state government. CISA would then forward them to social media companies for a response, like taking down the parody accounts. Yes, I can see how this very sophisticated disinformation is clearly a threat to the homeland. In June, CISA's Cybersecurity Advisory Committee, which included Twitter's then head of legal policy, trust, and safety, drafted a report calling on the agency to closely monitor social media platforms of all sizes, mainstream media, cable news, hyper-partisan media, talk radio, and other online resources. And if you're wondering who decides what media is hyper-partisan, you're starting to see the problem. Although they do seem to be monitoring everybody, which on the bright side means someone may finally have listened to your cooking podcast. The report argued that the agency needed to take steps to halt disinformation with a focus on information that undermines key democratic institutions, such as the courts or by other sectors such as the financial system or public health measures. Yes, because it's disinformation that made people not trust the banks and not, you know, them ruining the economy in 2008 and getting bailed out for it. According to a draft of a Homeland Security report on future strategy, they plan to target disinformation on things like racial justice, the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan, and U.S. support for Ukraine. Many government officials say this is necessary. I don't know why, though. There's literally no way the U.S. could look worse for the way it abandoned Afghanistan. I'd actually encourage disinformation on that one because it'd make them look better. Homeland Security claims that terrorist threats can be exacerbated by misinformation and disinformation spread online. The Biden administration's director of CISA argues that since CISA is in the business of critical infrastructure, and since the most critical infrastructure is cognitive infrastructure, building up resilience to disinformation is incredibly important to CISA. Really. Cognitive infrastructure. You can't just call anything infrastructure just because you want to have some say over it. What's CISA going to do next? Call your terrible crab cakes food infrastructure so they can stop you from making them again? 
By that logic, it's easy to expand government power in the name of countering disinformation. This is also known as mission creep. But don't worry, it's not a violation of free speech. It's not government censorship, according to an FBI official. The government is just holding the media infrastructure accountable. Oh, okay, media is infrastructure too now. One way to hold media accountable is for CISA to improve its ability to do analytics on narrative intervention. Narrative intervention, that doesn't sound creepy at all. They're just trying to protect the nation's narrative infrastructure. Of course, the US government doesn't want to come across as authoritarian while doing all this, so CISA came up with a solution. Using third-party sources to spread information, so it didn't seem to directly come from the government. Because if it doesn't look like propaganda, it's not propaganda. All this leads to a lot of legal problems. I'll explain more after the break. Welcome back. The government says that CISA's efforts to fight disinformation are just holding the government and the media infrastructure accountable. But how is the government holding itself accountable? What if the things that it labels disinformation end up being true? The New York Post's Hunter Biden laptop story is the most obvious example. Back when the story first broke, over 50 former intelligence officers said it was Russian disinformation. And Facebook was gently nudged by the FBI to limit the New York Post's article about it. Even though ultimately, the New York Times verified the emails from the laptop. And remember the Steele dossier, which alleged that Trump was conspiring with Russia to win the 2016 election? Well, now even CNN admits that the credibility of the dossier has significantly diminished. Legitimate questions are now being raised about the dossier. How it was used by Democrats as a political weapon against trust, how it was handled by the FBI and US intelligence agencies, and how it was portrayed in the mainstream media. This also raises questions about whether politics might influence government action against alleged disinformation. All in the name of security. Of course, the government denies this. CISA has defended its policy, stating that once CISA notified a social media platform of disinformation, the social media platform could independently decide whether to remove or modify the post. That's kind of like a mugger saying, once I asked for their wallet, they could independently decide whether or not to give it to me. But CISA's meeting minutes show that its goal is to make platforms more responsive to their suggestions. According to a professor of law at George Washington University, there is growing evidence that the legislative and executive branch officials are using social media companies to engage in censorship by surrogate. And big tech isn't exactly fighting back. Microsoft executive Matt Masterson, a former DHS official, texted Jen Easterly, a DHS director, in February saying, platforms have got to get comfortable with government. It's really interesting how hesitant they remain. Meanwhile, Facebook has a portal for reporting disinformation that requires a government or law enforcement email to log in. Yep, the government got on Facebook, and you thought it was an invasion of privacy when your mom joined. This raises a lot of First Amendment questions, and not just the legislative and executive branches saying, First Amendment, what's that? The Attorneys General of Missouri and Louisiana filed a lawsuit in May alleging that the Biden administration pressured and colluded with social media companies to censor and suppress information about the Hunter Biden laptop story, the origins of COVID, and the security of voting by mail. The case argues that the government can't encourage or threaten private persons or entities to accomplish what it is constitutionally forbidden to accomplish. That would be like if a mugger forced someone else to take your wallet and give it to him and then said, well, technically, I didn't do it. The federal district judge in Louisiana is now ordering a lot of high-ranking officials to testify about the alleged collusion between the government and social media. This includes the director of CISA, former White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki, and Dr. Anthony Fauci. We'll have to see where that leads and if it will put the Homeland Security Cinematic Universe on hold. And this episode has been sponsored by Incogni. Whenever you do anything online, it's not just the government that's there watching you. There's also a huge number of private companies that are collecting your personal data. 
For example, when you sign up for Facebook, they're collecting your name, phone number, location, and biographical information, like where you went to school and who you're in a complicated relationship with. It's bad enough that Facebook has all this info. It's even worse when Facebook gets hacked. Like that time last year when hackers stole the data for 1.5 billion Facebook users and put it up for sale, which is terrible. It's even worse than when Facebook sells your personal data to advertisers. The point is, no matter where you put your data online, whether you sign up for a newsletter, a discount coupon, etc., there are going to be people trying to steal your data. So if you want to protect your privacy, you should get your data removed from as many companies and websites as possible. That's what Incogni is for. When I signed up in February this year, I discovered there were 76 data brokers that potentially had my private information. Since then, that number has nearly doubled. Fortunately, Incogni has been working hard to force these companies to delete my data. Nine months after signing up, Incogni has already gotten my details removed from 67 data brokers with 75 more in progress. And I still haven't had to do anything after signing up. So get your data taken offline using Incogni. Click the link below or go to incogni.com slash uncovered. The first 100 people to use the code uncovered will get 20% off. Get your personal data off the market with Incogni. Once again, I'm Chris Chappell. Thanks for watching America Uncovered.